Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to LASER, Leonardo Art and Science Evening Rendezvous, Silent. Today, discussion, art collecting and digital art. The Leonardo LASER are programs of international gathering that bring together scientists, artists for informal conversation and uh, with the wider public. The mission of LASER is to encourage the contribution to the cultural environment of the region by fostering interdisciplinary dialogue and opportunities for community building. Digital computer art, software, and multimedia art forms have been created for many years and entered the mainstream. And gradually, museums and private collectors are beginning to accession works of digital media into their art collection. Please join today the panelists, digital mixed media artist, curator, and art collector, and spelter, and art, art collector, Leonid Franz, as they share their passion and their history about collecting. From paintings to digital media to NFTs, focusing on the role of technology on, uh, in creative process and actually addressing the issues of collecting and curating those dynamic, while vulnerable, hybrid medias and techniques that relies on digital technology in creative and display processes. Our first speaker today is Anne Spalter. She is a digital mixed media artist and academic pioneer who founded art programs at Brown University and Rhode Island School of Visual Arts in the 90s. She is the author of the Computer Visual Arts in 1999. Her own works are in permanent collection in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London and School of Design Museum in Provenance. She is also known for her large-scale installation, including the commission work in 2016 by MTA uh, for her work, New York Dreaming, for New York Subway Station and Fulton, uh, and Fulton Station. The Anne and Michael Spelter collection, the Spelter Digital, is one of the world's largest collection comprising more than 500 works from the early from the early uh, digital art. And how did you came into the field of digital art? And why did you stay? What was your inspiration behind the Spalty Digital Collection? Tell us about yourself, your creative, uh, creative interest in the art collection. And? Uh, thank you so much, Natalia. Um, it's an honor to be here and to be addressing this very international audience in so many different time zones. And um, I have been in this field forever now, both as an artist and a collector. And it's been really exciting and wonderful. Um, I'm going to show some slides and tell you a bit about my journey uh, as an artist and a collector, because it's been very interwoven with those two hats. So let me share my screen. this laser talk. And I think the experience can be summed up as a roller coaster experience, where every few years um, in the both as an artist and a collector, I feel that now everyone understands how fantastic and important digital art is, and it's going to be accepted and shown in museums everywhere. And everyone finally understands it. And then we sort of um, sort of two steps forward and one step backward. And I start hearing from people again, the same question, is it really art or did the computer make this for you? And, and I feel like I'm back at square one, but I do think there's progress, but the experience is, is emotional. It's like you're up, you're down. Um, you keep thinking you're getting somewhere, but maybe you're just like hanging upside down. So um, I, I began doing this, a quite a while ago now. In the 1990s, I, um, I had started out as an undergraduate in the 
painting program at the Rhode Island School of Design. And I really didn't like computers, didn't think they should be involved in the arts, thought all art should be a physical media that you could use with your hands and interact with. So I kind of understand where people are coming from when they initially say, what are you doing with the computer? Because I, I did start out as a computer phobe, but um, after spending some time in a regular job in banking and falling in love with the computer and starting to use it in my artwork, I had come back to graduate school at the Rhode Island School of Design and really wanted to use the computer in my work and met with all this hostility about it. I actually had a visiting critic from New York come and refuse to look at my work. Not because they thought it was bad, they didn't even see it. They just said they didn't wanna look at it because I used the computer. And it made me aware of this perception that if it was involved, there was something wrong, that it was usurping some sort of creative role that was supposed to be the artists. And I began to experiment. And at that time I had purchased a printer, which was incredibly exciting to own your own laser printer. And I forced a piece of BFK paper through it, which is beautiful printing paper. And I put it up in a critique and I said, I had made an etching. And I got a really great response on it. And later when I disclosed that it was actually a computer print, suddenly, the reaction changed. And it just made me aware of how the perception was based on psychological factors more than what the artwork looked like. And that a lot of introducing people to digital art and understanding it had to do with these perceptions and where the final piece ended up on the, um, the sort of analog digital uh, back and forth that many artists go through. Digital artwork, you don't look at the file, you know, you're always seeing it on a screen or printed out. If it emerges in some sort of analog format, it's often much more acceptable in the digital art world. Whereas if it's some more digital thing, it's not. And that's very interesting to me. I did a lot of experimentation with printmaking because that was more acceptable, even though it was digital. Um, I really wanted to learn more about it. I wanted to take a class and there weren't any, and I was asked to teach one. I ended up, um, teaching a class and writing a book to have material for my course and put everything I knew together in one place. It took over five years and had everything that was in my brain at the time came out in this book. There were some um, wonderful materials that I did use in my course, including the book by Herbert Frankie, who sadly passed away just recently. And this book, um, Digital Visions by Cynthia Goodman, who I had the wonderful opportunity to meet recently. Um, in Washington, D.C. at the Archive of American Art, the Smithsonian, and got her to sign it for me. When I was writing this book, Michael Spalter was forced to learn about computer art because this took over my life. And he was an art history major. And he said, you know, these computer artists, they're like the impressionists. Nobody likes them. The Academy hates them, but their artwork is beautiful. They have decades of um, practice and bodies of work and we should support them. And we got to know all these wonderful artists and started collecting. Um, and that collection has grown and grown. It's all online at spalterdigital.com. And um, we've become real proselytizers of early digital artwork. So we wanted to make the work available for curators and students and everyone to understand this history of early digital art and learn about it and kind of spread the word. And there's now over a thousand pieces and we've lent work to uh, museums all over the world, including MoMA. Um, and this is one of our favorite artists, Vera Molnar, who is now 98 and is finally getting the recognition that she's deserved all along and having work all over, including a solo show right now up at the UC Irvine Bell uh, Center for Art and Technology. Um, our first artwork, we had to decide whether to buy artwork or a sofa, but we made the right decision. This wonderful work by Harold Rosenblum of a crab. He um, was a sculptor who started working with Photoshop. And the collection has all kinds of things in it from very early work that's not even digital, uh, analog oscilloscope, work photographed right off the screen to um, repurposed bomb sighting machines, this custom made drawing machine by Desmond Paul Henry to plotter works, which make up the bulk of the collection because that's how works were generated in the um, 60s and 70s for the most part, generative artwork. 
Some of these are very large. Uh, these multi-layer works by Jean-Pierre Hébert took sometimes 48 hours to plot. He had to stay awake to change the pens. And if something went wrong in hour 36, he had to start over. So physically demanding works as well as you know intellectually and aesthetically to impact printers, the dot matrix printer, for those of us old enough to remember, to um, silk screens and even more um, contemporary works, software, like uh, augmented reality. But these are harder to archive and maintain for a private collection. So um, we tend to have things that are more archival. The plotter works are India ink on paper. So that's uh, simpler. Uh, David Hockney has experimented with technology all along, has some fantastic uh, iPad drawings that are large prints and some conceptual pieces as well. Um, and a few 3D printing works and digital video. Uh, recently, I started collecting NFTs, especially generative on-chain ones, because those seem to me to be direct ancestry, uh, you know, descendants of early digital artwork because they're generative, but it was a new form, sort of long form digital artwork, generative artwork. So I'm very interested in that as well. I'm going to wrap up with that so that there's time for the other presentations and questions, but that's just a brief overview and um, look forward to answering questions about all of that uh, after the other presentations. If my mouse comes back, I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Anne. You're welcome. Our next speaker is Leonid Franz. Leonid Franz received his PhD in computer science from Stanford University. In 2004, he founded One Market Data, one of the leading provider of software and data for the financial industry, including OneTick, a comprehensive suite for the time series data management and real-time analytical event processing. The Leonid and Anna Franz collection, family collection focuses primarily on St. Petersburg art, and over the time, the Franz family collection grew to include numerous works of the first half of the 20th century, works from post-war period, including works by many nonconformist as well as contemporary artists. In addition to paintings and works on paper, the collection also features installations, new media, sculptures, even mosaics and glass works. The collection consists of around 3,000 artworks and covers the extended period of time from the 1920s till nowadays and include a wide range of artistic styles and media. This makes it an invaluable resource for studying Leningrad and St. Petersburg art for the past 100 years. And currently, the exhibition ID Art and Technology from the Kaladzi Art Foundation and Franz Family Collection is on view at Tmora in Minneapolis, Minnesota until August 14 of this year. Leonid, what was the inspiration behind the Franz Family Collection? Please tell us about yourself and, your, and the major trends and the history for your art collection. Leonid. Thanks. Yes, in our case, I don't think it was really a particular inspiration behind it. It was just a general ability to appreciate uh, certain beautiful, let's call them, objects, which uh, give you joy. Uh, and no more than that, uh, Anna has been in art for a long time. I really um, only got closely involved maybe about 20, 25 years ago. So um, not that long, but it all comes uh, down to being able to appreciate the aesthetic uh, component to it. Um, uh, it's um, actually interesting. Maybe it's because of my background or maybe because I look at a little bit more generally, to me, the questions discussed today in this talk, they don't really uh, sound that uh, uh, kind of, um, you know, that new. To me, uh, art has always been art, 
And uh, for most part, the digital form of it is just another technique. So uh, uh, as Anne correctly pointed out, there is a great psychological uh, barrier for many people to accept it. But what's strange is that it has been done so many times before that uh, it's strange that we still have the inability to say, okay, well, we moved from basically two-dimensional art and sculpture to objects, to conceptual, to whatever else. And it's been done so many times to uh, Namjoon Pike to, that uh, it, it's still a barrier, an obstacle to many people to say, okay, well, why art cannot be made of these different materials, right? It's, uh, uh, it, ha it has to be psychological. But to me, again, maybe it's because my, of my late entry, this has not even been noticed by me really. Okay, it's another object. It's just a different tool that has been used to make this object. It hasn't been a brush or you know, paint or marble or whatever, but ultimately the way you interact, uh, most people interact with this kind of art is still visually and audially. So it's still, is it aesthetically pleasing to you or not? Is it you see some great statement, be it an aesthetic statement, political statement, cultural statement in it, or you do not? There is no difference. Uh, uh, whether it's made of, uh, uh, you know, of paint or coded in zeros and ones, and then uh, somehow transformed into something else. If it's made on a computer, what does it matter? Somebody had to program the computer, and somebody had to use that program to build the work of art. Uh, again, how is it different uh, from using a paintbrush? Uh, so to me, to me, it's uh, the question. It's really more an observation on uh, on the state of understanding among people. It's not uh, the question itself is not that fascinating because I don't see a huge difference between, for example, this this work of art here. Ultimately, the way that it interacts with me, still I'm looking at it, and is uh, I like the way it moves or I don't like the way it moves, and uh, it touches something me, it doesn't. And that's it versus this one, which is really as traditional as it gets, even though it's clearly like 20th century art, uh, but still. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's probably a little bit different because uh, particularly when you get to, let's say when you get into conceptual art, when it's not a um, hard physical object. And uh, if you look at it aesthetically, you have to look at it, uh, from a point of view of aesthetics in a concept, in an idea. So maybe it's a bit different uh, when it comes to digital art that yes, some people uh, who do have special education, uh, specifically in some instances, maybe computer science education, maybe they can see a little bit more because they just understand, they may understand a certain beauty, they can see certain beauty of a program itself not of what the artist did with the program, but maybe the tools that was given to the artist. Ultimately, in many cases, it's a program. It's a result of some of this programming. And maybe we could see uh, that certain things have been written uh, more beautifully or less beautifully, but still it's an intermediate step. It doesn't usually come, uh, come out in the end, in the final uh, product. And that difference would still be minor. For most part, uh, Again, when we look at, uh, at, at things like that, we're still observing uh, the end product. So, uh, as, you know, as, as much as I would like to uh, kind of, uh, talk about digital art, to me, it's just a natural evolution. As time goes on and more and more tools become available uh, to express ourselves, uh, it's just natural that people will be using everything that, you know, that they have at their disposal. Um, I think the real explosion really happened uh, probably in the early 20th century, right? Probably starting from uh, Duchamp 
And uh, that's when the explosion in techniques um, really took place. Right now, it's just, uh, I think the step is a little bit smaller. So the real issue is a psychological issue. And maybe one of the explanations is that there is there's a certain aversion, uh, I guess, in human uh, uh, in humans to robots doing things. There is some association. It has been a case when, for the first time, a computer program could beat a human in chess. Uh, it's just uh, we don't want that to happen for whatever psychological reasons. And uh, hence, we try to find all kinds of reasons why it's not fair. Well, in this case, we would uh, uh, subconsciously try to find reasons why it's not art. And they're not uh, logical reasons. That's, uh, uh, we just don't want it to happen. We think that uh, we possess some certain skills which machines uh, do not. Well, they do not, but at some point they possess more and more. And at some point the works of art will be created even without our our assistance also. I mean, with the initial assistance, somebody has to program original ideas, but then it's quite possible that uh, even without our interference, a computer program could generate a piece of art, which is just as interesting as anything generated by, uh, by humans. So I don't know, I think uh, the presentation, you know, unlike Anne, I don't really have a slide presentation, but, um, it is fairly informative because in this presentation, there are some not fairly randomly selected work from our collection. And again, uh, you can see, you look at one of them, which is as traditional as it gets. And then you look at something like this. Well, it's not computer generated, but it's obviously uh, contemporary and it has mechanical element and has uh, some of them have a programmed element and it might not reflect in the final image. The image may not be directly computer generated, but it still has a computer element or robotic, a robotic element in it. And uh, you kind of look at them, okay, that's a work of art and that's a work of art and that's a work of art. And here's an object that used to be a, a mechanical or an electrical object, but it's not anymore. Here's the video. So I, I I don't know. Yes, it's it's interesting, but I think it's just a, it's just a temporary phase. Uh, give it another 10, 15, 20 years, and particularly new generation that grows up uh, already observing it and kind of taking it as kind of uh, as is. This is part of their lives. So they want to be asking that question. Was it generated by using a particular program or by somebody holding a brush or a chisel. So anyway, I can probably go on for a long time, but that's uh, um, that's probably a summary of uh, my view on art collecting. You ultimately collect uh, the things which you like, or some people might collect for investment purposes. You know, some people may collect uh, because of their neurosis and they just need to collect. But those reasons are the same. It's nothing to do with whether it's digital or, or physical. Um, I just realized actually, as Anne was uh, speaking, uh, there were a few works which I didn't even realize. I didn't even think of them as digital. Uh, when I, um, when we gave some works for this presentation to be compiled, uh, and as Anne was speaking, I, uh, pulled them up. Uh, what was interesting to me is that indeed it wasn't, uh, it wasn't even a thought. It was just, okay, it looks good. Uh, let's get it. Uh, okay. So let me share my screen. This is a contemporary Russian artist from Moscow. It's uh, not only printed graphics, but it's actually generated graphics. And uh, uh, they're not lithographs, they're just uh, exactly as Anne was uh, saying, they just, he designed them on a printer. He never, uh, the only time that they take a physical form is when, they, when they're printed. Obviously the guy found his own kind of funny uh, way of expressing his visual ideas, these, uh, somewhat contemporary, somewhat 1970s, somewhat Soviet images using a completely new 
a technique why are they not new people you uh, you know have been using computers to print things but very expressive works as far as i'm concerned just uh literally never gave it a thought before it just occurred to me only as then was speaking how uh, hold on these are these are actually uh, printed works uh, so anyway that's just a, a side slideshow but uh not much difference to me between this and a lithograph or a painting. Uh, uh, of course, you use a different technique to to achieve different effects. Yes, yeah, that's that's about it. Yes, thank you, Leonid. Now we'll come to our discussion. Thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, first, we'll touch a little bit on the criteria aspect of uh, digital art. Art. Uh, personally. Uh, I have spent my whole life immersed in art. And since I remember myself, I was surrounded by artworks, which my mother, Tatiana Kaladze, collected for over 50 years. And today, the Kaladze collection of uh, Eastern U European art consists of more than 7,000 objects, including paintings, works on paper, sculpture, digital art installation by more than 300 artists from Eastern Europe. Uh, for us, it was uh, a very important, uh, the media criteria we used was uh, originality and talent and the quality of the work. The particular movement the, uh, the artist belonged to, belong to was of less important. The digital artworks are, are collected using many, many criteria, and as we, we mentioned before, its uniqueness, originality, professional quality, aesthetic quality, like composition, color tones, uh, conceptual idea behind it, selection or application of the materials, uh, the complexity and level of the digital technology. Alenit, I'll start with you. As a collector, you did mention a little bit about this in your talk, in your presentation, but as a collector of both paintings and digital media, what are your main criteria for collecting digital art? How these criteria differ or similar for the paintings and works on paper and digital art? Yes, in my case, literally, there is no difference. Uh, it, since we collect purely for um, self-enjoyment and the criteria is uh, whether, it, whether it's aesthetically or whatever that means aesthetically in many domains. It could be in a visual domain, in an audio domain, could be in a conceptual domain, but ultimately whether aesthetically it's pleasing or not. So it's exactly the same criteria for us. There's just something in the world that makes you like it and that's it. Uh... Yeah. And, and now for you, for, because you're wearing too many hats as an artist, curator, and not collector. So what do you think your main criteria for digital art? Yep, um, I completely agree that if we don't love it, we don't collect it. And I know people do collect art as an investment, but um, I think that you never know if art's going to be worth more or less in the future. So I highly recommend for people collecting art. If you don't enjoy it, don't don't collect it. Because if you collect something that you love, then in, in the very worst case scenario, you have something beautiful to look at on your wall. So, you know, it's a no lose proposition that way and there's nothing sadder I, I think than buying something and then you hang it up and you don't like it and it sort of moves around in your house and ends up in the basement or somewhere in storage and maybe because I'm an artist as well like that's physically painful for me so that that's definitely the first criteria that we have to love the piece aesthetically and then the collection is focused on early digital art or something directly related to that so it's it also has to be within that you know, conceptual window as well. Yeah, thank you. And I'll continue with you. Uh, we discussed that nowadays, the digital medium is extremely hybrid. And for the past uh, few years, you have been involved in working with the crypto art and NFT, including the curating exhibition by NFT Now. What are the major issues which crypto space and NFT introduces into the archiving, into the collecting methods? What is the biggest challenges today? And what effect the NFT made on the art, mar art, um, uh, art market and collecting? Um, the whole NFT blockchain, you know, crypto art phenomenon has been 
fantastic for a digital artwork. It's really helped bring it to the attention of many people who never thought about digital artwork before. And it's introduced a whole new group of collectors to collecting art. Um, so I think it's been a wonderful contribution to the art world. It's from our perspective has been great for generative artwork, which before was a sort of niche thing that people and technical and interested in digital art knew about, but in general people weren't that interested in. And now because of the huge prices that um, some of the early, especially uh, art blocks drops uh, commanded like ringers and fidenzas, um, there has been this huge interest in generative artwork and that translated into interest in the pioneering artists and the work that they did like Farrah Molnar and Manfred Moore and Frieder Naki and has helped tie together that art history to things going on now. And it's wonderful to see that younger artists creating this generative artwork and who have made money in this field are now collecting those older artists as well. So it's a wonderful, I think, circle of success for that type of artwork. Thank you very much. And uh, now Leonid, putting aside the NFT, we spoke about uh, the hybrid kind of, the hybrid medium of digital art. Uh, like hybrid in the connection to the uh, like a digital and kinetic, digital and painting, digital and prints. And what are your thoughts on this uh, new formats for digital media? Um, I, yeah, Besides the, the fee. At, at the, at the fee of sound and boring. Uh, they, as far as I'm concerned, they just give you a new form, new way to express yourself. Uh, it, it's all happened before many times. So there is no significant, uh, no significant difference uh, for me. It's not like we haven't had uh, hybrid art before. I mean, we had uh, painted sculpture since Greek times, right? I mean, it's now that we have uh, uh, all those Aphroditas that are completely white. They haven't always been white. Uh, in antiquity, they, you know, they had color. Well, that's already hybrid. You take a sculpture, you, what is it, a sculpture or not? And then you paint it. You're know, talking about contemporary sculpture. You turn it, you paint it, it's been like that forever. So how is that not hybrid? Okay, so then you attach a, attach a stick to a piece of marble and uh, it becomes an object. I don't know, it's always been hybrid. It's... Uh, to me, it's a non-issue, really. Now we're switching to a slightly different hybrid collaboration. And um, what are your thoughts on ideal collaboration between the artist and art collectors in terms of displaying, maybe installation process, uh, commission digital art? What, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I think that NFTs have made a much tighter connection between collectors and artists. It's much easier to communicate directly as an artist with my collectors and as a collector with the artists that I'm collecting. So I think that's a big plus um, for both sides. There are a lot of challenges with displaying NFTs. You know, on the one side, it's great because you could see your collection wherever you go. You can bring them up on your phone or your laptop and show them to everyone. And that's wonderful. But on the other hand, you can't you know, see them on the wall and they don't have this tangibility to them. Um, I know some collectors have fantastic displays in 3D worlds like CryptoVoxels or with um, programs like OnCyber.io. And that's nice to sort of be able to walk around or navigate on your screen and see collections um, and different curations of their collections. There are some screens where you can show NFTs that are in your wallet, you know, that connects directly to a screen and you can show things or you can show um, on an infinite objects little screen, you know, one NFT at a time gets sort of uh, burned into the screen. And those are very beautiful, but there's only one at a time. To me, there's no kind of ideal one way to show an NFT collection yet. I've seen um, fantastically beautiful screens at uh, Gallery Vellum LA. They had uh, these amazing uh, Canva screens or canvas, I didn't even know what the company was, little LED squares made into these really beautiful screens, um, very high resolution, no edges, you know, beautiful, but fantastically expensive as well. 
Um, I think there's a range of display options, and but no one is sort of perfect for showing all of your NFTs. So it's a it's an open area, and I think um, you know more companies will get in there and offer different display devices for people to use. Uh, uh, Leonid, and what are your thoughts on uh, this kind of ideal collaboration between the artist and collector in displaying or like installation process or uh, commissioning the works? I think it's just a natural evolving process. I, I, I think I agree. I, I don't know that much about NFTs other than how they work. So it, it does seem that they have played a very positive role in uh, recognition acceptance of uh, digital art. Um, I'm a little bit maybe confused and maybe ambiguous about them because to me the art itself, it's NFT itself is not the art. That's not what you're re really showing, right? This is, it certainly uh, can identify legal aspects aside because they're not clear at all. Does it really uh, give you attention? But let's just, it identifies the object of art that you own and you can show it, but it's, the NFT itself is not the object of art. It's like a description. It may as well be linked. It's probably much more secure description and something to which uh, financial value can be assigned kind of more safely from a point of view of people who do it, you know, who do look at it as an investment, as in something valuable, which certainly make it much more, uh, much more possible. But uh so it's to me it's not really the uh, the nft itself it's just uh the, it's more like a vehicle to help make other art acceptable because i guess you can assign an nft to just a regular object a sculpture as well um okay yeah it's a unique sculpture sculpture by definition is non-fungible because you can uh, you know you will never make a copy yes you can make you can assign it to print so it's it's all very useful, but I think we still should separate the NFT. So of course, at some point, somebody can make an art piece, you know, made entirely of NFTs. Uh, but NFT has to have some kind of a visual expression. Then maybe some series of zeros and ones, or so, you know, or, or like a, you know, it's a difference between a link and the actual image work uh, work of art. But yeah, I don't think there is any denial that it's play, it's playing a very significant uh, significant role. Um, again, it's, I think people who do it purely for investment purposes, though, should be um, probably should be a bit careful. Uh, it's completely new legal ground. I mean, it's it's like uh, virtual currencies. Uh, you know, everybody hopes that in the end they'll become completely widely accepted, and most likely they will. It's just that these are early days. Um, but, but ultimately, to me, I still make a clear differentiation. Until they start making art with NFTs themselves, which is a you know, perfectly fine idea as far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, you know, as long as you can represent an NFT somehow. Until then, those are two different aspects to me. There is art and there is uh, an identification mechanism and ownership uh, yeah. mechanism. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Leonid. And in your actually show an NFT now, you try kind of to differentiate the actually art making process of NFTs and NFT as a secure document. Yeah, so some, um, Leonid is right that usually the token is sort of a certificate of authenticity and then there's a pointer to an image file that's actually stored separately and not on the blockchain but some nfts are stored entirely on the blockchain so the generative art nfts that we largely collect like the ones on art blocks the whole thing is on the blockchain so actually the token is the artwork so sometimes it is all actually one thing okay. it, yeah it depends on the piece mm -hmm. And uh, what are your predictions uh, for the future of art and tech? Uh, will the industry continue to be hesitant sometimes or to adopt new technologies? Or has it been hard or been passed? What are your thoughts? So recently I've been using all these cool new um, AI tools, artificial intelligence. 
And I think people are just going to be completely blown away if you haven't seen what's going on in the world of AI with things like DALI and Midjourney and um, GPT-3 tools, which are the text writing tools. It's truly mind blowing. So I think some of the, the concerns which were very misplaced with early generative art of the computer actually doing some creative task for the artist are actually now legitimate issues with AI where the computer is really kind of like a partner with you in the studio doing truly amazing things on its own. Um, and that there's gonna be a lot of very interesting issues to discuss. You have to do a whole nother panel on that. Yes, but I think uh, people don't cool. even like yet grasp what, what is happening in this whole field of AI. It's very fun, but it's also a little bit creepy. And Leonita, and what are your thoughts on, on the future of art and technology? Oh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's infinite. I, I do, actually, I haven't seen the programs uh, where machine learning has been applied to art yet, but just by looking at what's happening in machine learning right now, uh, in general, and how much more, again, uses the same word, how much more general the machine learning algorithms have become. So it's no longer just, okay, can we teach a program to play chess? It's, uh, can we teach a program uh, pretty much to understand uh, any activities that, you know, human or maybe like non-human does just by looking at uh, kind of at the output, trying to understand what it by itself, yeah, the implications are going to be huge. There is, uh, you know, no doubt in my mind, and I don't even have to have seen anything yet. I and mean, Anne has mentioned three particular, I guess, uh, machine learning programs, algorithms already used for it. I don't even know. I don't know what they are, but uh, you know, I have no doubt that that's a direction, uh, or you know, one uh, a very important direction of evolution. And it's not, it's not too far in the future. It's, uh, I think the way machine learning is growing now, unlike like 30 years ago where everybody was predicting, oh, AI is gonna solve everything in two years and five years. And they've been doing it since 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. You know, finally, uh, AI did manage, manage to do a few things, but uh, still uh, kind of pales in comparison to what a human brain can do. Now it seems to be evolving uh, developing at a much faster speed. It still will take a long time. It's not tomorrow, but it's certainly much more tangible, it seems. Uh, and yeah, the impact of art is just, uh, yeah, it's going to be huge. So there is a great future for the art and tech. So we just need to watch for the new works. Yeah, and, there is a great uh, art and a great future. What do you think the new generation of um, art collectors will change buying trends or patterns or, and uh, how they will engage in the art world? What do you think, what, what do you think the new generation will bring in into art collecting? There's a question to Gwen. I mean, I think there's, a, there's an interesting new, I don't know, generation, but a new group of art collectors that have come in through cryptocurrency and um, are still, there's still sort of largely non-overlapping kind of Venn diagram circles of um, collectors who made money in cryptocurrency, started buying NFTs, I think, because there's nothing to buy with cryptocurrency. And my, I, my thesis is they started buying them just as store of value or investment, didn't really know that much about art and became, um, you know, involved, they began to love some of them. They didn't want to sell them because it's artwork. You know, you, you begin to love the things and you meet the artists and you start learning about them and you start learning about art. And a lot of these people have become true art lovers and true art collectors and they are smart people to begin with. And, you know, you can learn about art, anyone can learn about art. And now there's a whole group of really fanatical art collectors who I just in the past, you know, five years have come way up this learning curve, learned about art and created these really wonderful collections. And I think have brought more people in behind them as well and shown that you don't have to 
you know, come from a family of art collectors who have gone to art school or studied art history to enjoy art and start collecting art and NFTs and the blockchain have made that possible. So I think that's really wonderful. Anyone, and there's all different price points out there. So you don't have to be, you know, buying things at a famous auction house. You can go on, you can be on Tezos, you can, you can buy things for $25 that are really wonderful. So I think there's a great future of that. These things, they will branch out to paintings and the works on paper as well, to the physical, to the physical objects, tangible objects. Um, I know some of them have. So I don't know how much it will cross over, but I imagine that it would because I think, um, as Lane had said, it's all the same. There's not really a difference between digital art and, you know, sculpture or painting. So I think once you have that interest that you'll start you know, looking at other things. I think the traditional art world makes it challenging to buy art. So I think that art world needs to change a little bit to make it easier for more collectors to enter it. And Lenita, and what are your thoughts on this new generations of uh, new generation of art collectors? Yeah, I, I, I think there's as, as, as overlapping, I would say. It's not like there has been a la lack of money in the world before even new money, not that it's not, art has not for a long time has not necessarily been purchased by old money. So I think that trend we have seen for for a long time and uh, you can kind of claim uh, that during the internet bubble that uh, suddenly a whole bunch of new uh, millionaires, billionaires appeared and uh, Oh, now they can buy art because they, they might not be familiar with the galleries, but they have all this money. No, there has always been plenty of money in the world. And the barriers though, have changed. Uh, it's just that these people, it's a new generation and um, who may not have uh, grown up with, um, with appreciation of, uh, of beauty, of aesthetics. This just gives them another way, a more natural way to enter through there, it's not because they may have a lot of money necessarily, but they're very familiar with virtual objects, with digital objects, with NFTs, blockchains. To, so to them, they kind of enter the same domain. It's the same plain domain, just through a different uh, door. And then I agree completely, once you do that, your eye itself, it starts, uh, unless you're just collecting for the sake of collecting, again, it could be a purely like a neurotic uh, activity. But uh, then once you start looking at objects which are more aesthetic, more beautiful, your eye just gets trained by itself. And uh, you become part of that uh, larger kind of collector group. So it will, it will definitely help extend it. But it's, it's, a, new, it's a new generation, uh, uh, really, which uh, uh, I think, it, again, it's all been happening for a long time. Uh, I'm not sure if the separation, it's not like these people have been completely isolated in their programming and trading of Bitcoin exercises. You know, they walk down the street, they do see architecture, they see uh, contemporary art objects, but it could be a very useful trigger to, uh, to get into it. Uh, uh, you know, once you do come into possession of your first art object, which maybe you purchased simply because it's a blockchain or you know, it's an NFT and that's what interests you. Later on, as you start looking at it more and more, you start deriving different kinds of pleasure from it. And uh, you just get more involved with the visual world of, world of art in general, not just limiting yourself. I think that will be, that will be the effect. It's, um, yeah, so it's all good for the art, uh, you know. <laughs> And if I there was one, someone yes, told Suzanne. me that um, they received an NFT as a gift and it was the most expensive present they ever got because then they start collecting NFTs. It, it's really fun. So I think once people get into it, it's, it's easy to, uh, it's very addictive. But once you start. That, yeah, that's a key part. It's a, as far as the collection aspect is concerned, it's a trigger. How do you get into it first? How do you get the first, second, third piece? until you, you actually start experience that enjoyment, not the enjoyment of owning, but enjoyment of 
look uh, you know of, of the beauty because most you know most most but the majority of people they're not like Anne. Anne is an artist uh, so but I think majority of people are not really uh, they don't encounter art face to face consciously throughout their lives uh, you know it's uh, not that many people uh, you know we have a different crowd here in this uh, discussion but. Uh, Many people never go really to a museum and whatever objects they see in the street, they just absorb them as objects and whatever, you know, it's just part of life, not a special designs or works of art. So yeah, so that will be uh, one of, you know, just uh, another way to increase the number of people who, 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 who experience art directly firsthand, enjoy it. Uh, and this also one of the aims of the laser to bring more people to the to the art conversation to the art and science conversation and uh, so if if there was one thing which uh, which you would like the public to take away from today's um, laser what will be what would what it will be go and buy a piece of art <laughs> and yeah i agree and and trust your own intuition about what you like. But buy something that speaks to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Anne Spelter, and thank you, Leonid Franz, for sharing your thoughts and your passion for art collecting and perspective and perspective or perspective on art and uh, digital media and your passion for the digital media will bring us a step closer to recognition that there's a major movement of the 21st century, or at least uh, equal to the paintings and sculpture. Thank you, the audience, and thank you, Silent Media Art Lab and the Kaladzi Art Foundation team and the Leonardo Journal community for fostering and guiding these dialogues on art and technology. So let's continue this conversation. Follow Silent Laser Leonardo Art and Science, Art and Science Evenings Rendezvous on social media. And we'll have next coming up soon on fermentation. So thank you and enjoy your day. Bye-bye. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, bye -bye.